We're going to stand to our feet. We're going to get a hold of God. We're going to sing this song where the spirit of the Lord is. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing out. Here we go. Let's sing it out with all our heart. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is peace. There is love. It is through Jesus He set us free. Well, I'm free. And I'm free. And I'm free. And I'm free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Sing it out. Where the Spirit of the Lord It is tonight, it is through. It is through Jesus who set us free. Well, I'm free, and I'm free, and I'm free, and I'm free. We will walk, we will walk in your freedom, walk in your liberty. Walk in your liberty. We will walk in your freedom. Walk in your liberty. We will walk in your freedom. Walk in your liberty. Where the spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is. Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Last time, where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. It is. I'm free and I'm free and I'm free and I'm free. I'm free. for he's worthy we're gonna sing this next song you are all i'm after here we go we will shout from all the rooftops we will sing from the highest hills come along join with heaven let the More than conquerors through him. Unfathom, untamed, unbridled, unrestrained. You are the hope that fills 
Give him praise this evening. We're gonna sing out this old song, Who is Like My God? Let's clap our hands. Let's sing it out. Here we go. Who is like my God? No one. No one. Who is like my God? No one. No one. Jehovah. Alpha and Omega, there is no one greater. You are lifted up, lifted up, Jehovah. Alpha and Omega, there is no one greater. You are lifted up, lifted up. Who is like my God? No one, no one. Who is like my God? For he is holy, we worship his mighty name. We're gonna move into this attitude of worship. Let's lift our hands. We're gonna sing out this song, Fresh Fire. Let's sing it out. So come and consume me. My heart is ready. God, if I burn, I'll burn for you. No hesitation, without reservation, God, if I burn, I'll burn. Sing it out with all your heart. Give me, give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. I'm going to burn for you. Fresh, fresh fire Give me a 
a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. Cause I'm gonna burn for you. We're gonna sing it out. Here we go. Each breath that I'm breathing. Each breath that I'm breathing. Each moment I'm given. God, if I live, I live for you. I love your presence, you're my obsession, God, if I live, I live, sing it out with all your heart, give me a fresh, give me a fresh, fresh fire, give me a fresh, fresh fire, I want what you desire, cause I'm gonna burn for you. Fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. Cause I'm gonna burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. a match and let it go set a place uncontrolled I want that fire I want that fire so light a match and let it go set a place uncontrolled I want that fire I want that fire If I burn, I'll burn for you. So God, if I burn, I'll burn for you. Sing it out with all your heart. So God, if I burn, I'll burn for you. So God, if I burn, I'll burn. Give me a fresh, give me a fresh, fresh fire. Fresh, fresh fire I want what you desire Cause I'm gonna burn for you Give me a fresh, fresh fire Give me a fresh, fresh fire I want what you desire Cause I'm gonna burn for you Yes, amen, we love his name, we worship his name we're going to sing this last song always. Here we go. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there are wonders and signs. And you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands. That your goodness is good without end. And you'll never change. I will tell. I will tell of your wonders. Sing of your grace. The God of creation. 
knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age. All generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now and always, always. I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence I know there is power. God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty, age after age. All generations bow down and praise the Lord is faithful.
Yorio lo robo siri de Amen, church. How many know God is good this evening? Amen. We're going to come before God's throne of grace and mercy this mor- uh, this evening uh, with several needs that we want to go before his throne of grace. Uh, we just want to pray for healing, uh, for Hilo, uh, for Leo, uh, salvation. Uh, I'm sorry, salvation for Leo, healing for Aubrey, and uh, salvation for the Castillo family. And there are many, many needs in this congregation. How many would agree with that? How many of us here have a need tonight, right? All of us. Some of you are like hands, feet, everything. God, I have so many needs. And let me tell you, we serve a mighty God who responds to his people. When his people are willing to come before him and say, God, I need you desperately. God responds to that. He is, that, that is the power of God that we serve tonight. Amen. So we're going to go before his throne of grace this evening, lifting up holy hands, lifting up our needs before the living king. And as we do that, Eric is going to come and open us up in prayer. Amen. Church, you lift up your voices. Amen. As we approach the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful grace and mercy. God, we come before you this evening, God, lifting up our petitions, God, for we know that you hear the cries of your people, Father. We pray that you speak to each and every person that is here, God. You bring healing, God, to those that are sick in body. God, bring salvation, Father. Here tonight upon us, Lord, I'm believing in you, anointing upon pastors, your ministers, your word. Speak to us, Father God. Challenge us tonight. Each and every need mentioned in this place, meet it with your miracle working power, God. I pray people People be refreshed tonight, lives to be transformed, the altars to be filled with your blood, God, and conversion, genuine conversion tonight. We put the service in your hands, God. You take control tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you, church. Yes, amen. As we greet each other this evening, we're going to sing out the song, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. 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 Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Give him praise this evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gael, and I would like to welcome you back to our evening service. If you're watching online or here in person, we are so glad you could join us. We have an exciting week ahead of us. Join us tomorrow as we preach the gospel. We will be standing on 10th and Nolana at 7 p.m. Come out and let everyone know about what God has done in your life. Ladies, tomorrow there will be a decorating of the Tree Fellowship for ages 13 and up. Come enjoy each other's company and bring a red, gold, or white ornament to help decorate the tree. This fun event will begin at 7 p.m. If you would like to help bring anything, go with Stacy Pettis. This Saturday, we will be meeting for our 10 a.m. morning outreach. Join us as we come together and invite our city to our church services. This ends our weekly announcements. We are so grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with us today. Remember to stay connected with us online at thedormancallum.com or through our app so you can stay connected with all that's happening in and around our church. Enjoy the rest of our service, and we'll see you soon. Amen. We have a wonderful time tonight. We just want to go over several of uh, quick announcements. Just want to add uh, to what was just mentioned, and that is that street preaching for... Uh, tomorrow will be canceled that way we need some men to come and help out amen so just keep that in mind and then also uh, just want to put in another plug for uh, the Christmas tree decoration that is that if the ladies can bring uh, either a red white gold or silver um, ornament and um, that'll be a wonderful blessing for that Glory to God, and I believe that's all the way we have an announcement. If we can just uh, take this time to receive the Lord's offering, amen. Glory to God. You know, I actually got this story. Uh, It's actually a children's story, um, but I got it for Tim, so if it flops, it all goes to him. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) 
so it's, who's ever heard of the Giving Tree story? It's a uh, children's book. Many of us here have. Some of you are like, what's a book? No, they have these things uh, that you can read from. Uh, but anyways, so this book is about a kid. Um, he goes to this tree, and, uh, you know, the tree um, loves the little boy. And every day, you know, while this young boy was there, he would go to this tree, and he would play with it. You know, he'd play with the leaves. Uh, he would, uh, you know, go sleep inside the tree. He'd climb it. Uh, he would eat from the apples from that tree. And he did this, you know, all throughout his youth. And then um, as he began to get older, you know, he began to slowly stop visiting the tree over time. And finally, you know, as he gets older, he now uh, decides to swing by. And the tree during this time was left alone. And finally, he visits the tree and the tree, you know, talks to him and says, hey, why don't you climb up on me, you know, eat some apples. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm already too old for that. Uh, he says, but... What I do need is some money. And the tree's like, well, I don't have money. But what I do have is I have these apples. You can pick from the apples. Um, and then you can, you know, take them downtown, sell them there in the marketplace to get money. So sure enough, the boy goes, picks every single apple uh, that he could get off that tree, goes to the marketplace, sells them downtown, gets his money. And just like, you know, young Men can be very selfish. He stops visiting this tree. So now time goes by. Um, he begins to get older for a very long time. Finally, he comes back and visits. And the tree says, why don't you come climb up the trunk, you know, swing on my branches. And, you know, the, the young man says, listen, I'm older now. I don't need to be playing on branches. But what I do need is a house. And, you know, the tree says, well, I have no house but you could cut off my branches and, you know, take from me to build your house. So sure enough, it's exactly what the boy does. And, you know, finally just, you know, things have been going back and forth. All throughout the years, the point is, this boy keeps taking from the tree. Anytime he needs something, he knows the tree is going to provide for me. No matter what happens, he knows I can depend on it. Finally, one day, the young man now goes and visits the tree and, you know, he says, you know, I'm, I'm a little hungry. The tree says, sorry, I have no more apples left to give. And now the tree is all withered away. You know, it's down to like a trunk and that's about it. Finally, the tree says, boy says uh, the young boy says, you know, I'm, I'm very tired. I'm very exhausted. And the tree says, well, all I have left is a stump. And the young boy, you know, sits on the tree and he begins to ponder and think about all these years, I've simply taken from the tree, but I've never given anything back. You know, the truth is, church, God forbid that as we come to church, right, we love the worship. How many of y'all enjoy the worship? Right? I mean, tonight, Holy Spirit was here. His presence fell upon us. We worship God. We're the God. Thank you so much for our McAllen Church. Thank you for, you know, Mama Church that's here, that we can come and enjoy the presence of God, that we can come in communion and community and enjoy all of this. And every service we come and take from Mama. But do we ever give back to the Mother Church? I'm here to tell you tonight, Every service we come and pull from her fruit, but woe be the day that we can no longer draw from mama because we're not giving back to her and to the kingdom of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know what it says? It says each of you. Not some of you. And it doesn't say, you know, uh, 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 might want to consider giving, right? That's our translation, you know. Some of you might want to consider giving. No, 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 no. It says each of you. Like we've been making those jokes. In the Greek, each of you means each of you. <laughs> All of us here should give according to what we have purposed in our heart. I pray that tonight you came to church ready and with purpose and vision saying, you know what, I'm going to continue to give to the house of God no matter what happens. Amen. So how many are ready to give? Amen. Let's go ahead and give to the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask our brother Frank if he would go and open this up in prayer. Father God, 
Amen, church. You give with a cheerful heart tonight. Yes, amen. As we give this evening, we're going to sing out this song, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. 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 Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. The name of the Lord is a strong town. Righteous run into it, and they are saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most high. Give a praise this evening. Numbers uh, 13. If you have your Bible, Numbers 13 and chapter 13 and 14, um, the street preaching is being canceled. We don't need guys to help here. We need you to help at your house and keep your kids there. <laughs> amen. And so uh, that is canceled uh, tomorrow. Amen. Tomorrow is just for the ladies here, 13 and up. Um, the Ryans, uh, I have to make an announcement. Uh, the Ryans were scheduled to leave on the 20th of this month, which is not tomorrow, but the following Monday. And uh, the paperwork uh, has not come through. And so uh, he's been working with uh, one of the uh, men there in India, trying his best to get in there. And uh, for whatever reason, it's being stalled. So um, because we are working with a window, our sister Andrea is expecting a baby, which makes, <laughs> which, which makes it, <laughs> amen, yeah, that's, that's, that's number, yeah, <laughs> that's good, kids are great, amen, but listen, um, that window now is closed, she had to, they had to leave this month so that she can be able to travel, and so now it's just not going to work. Um, and then the baby is due in March, so by the time she, the baby gets shots, we're talking about after conference now. Okay, so uh, what I've decided to do is I'm going to bring them on on staff, amen. The, the Ryans are coming on as assistants, amen. Uh, Bata is still on the table. Uh, Mari and Nicole are scheduled to leave right after conference, amen. Uh, one thing that I, I need you to understand is that we don't have everything figured out. And so the Ryans will be coming on. We're keeping up the deuces. Um, and, um, you know, I was thinking about Paul. You know, he wants to go to Asia. But God says, he says no. And uh, that doesn't work out. We don't, we don't have everything figured out. Amen. The last thing that we want is to get up here and make announcements and not fulfill the announcements. So Bata is still on the table. But what I'm deciding to do is I'm going to keep the Ryans on uh, as assistants permanently um, and, uh, and to be on staff. We're still going to bring um, in conference, I'm still going to announce uh, assistants the way we planned. Amen. Amari and Nicole were... Stepping in, filling in the shoes because of the emergency in Bolivia. So we will be bringing on another set of assistants as the DSs make their way to Bata. Now here's the problem, okay, and it's not really a problem. We have the couples, but we are keeping the Ryans permanently here, which means now India needs a couple. And so I'm just throwing that out there. Amen. Uh, we need a couple to go to India. We don't want to hang flags and not fulfill uh, what God is doing there. Okay. What does that mean? That means that 
um, whoever decides to go has to start their paperwork <laughs> and start all the process again. But we had been praying in the beginning of the year. I, I, I'd gone over this with the council just about building our staff now that we are a conference center. And so, you know, I had a couple of conversations with the council. I talked to Pastor Ruby about this last week, and I really feel that we need uh, two assistants. I feel that uh, the church needs to begin to carry itself and develop into that type of leadership church. And so you guys help us pray for that. But like I said, I don't want to get in the habit of making announcements and not fulfilling them. And so I'm going to ask you to help me pray. Pray, help me pray for the next assistance and help me pray for a couple that would say, you know what, we'll go um, to India. Amen. Hallelujah. Why don't we give them one more hand as we welcome in. You know, I wish we had it all figured out, man. It would be great. <laughs> but I feel, you know, I preached on Providence this morning. And I feel like God worked this out for us. Uh, it's almost as if I don't even have to pick. It's like God made it so easy. This is who I want on staff. And so it's working out great. Uh, uh, what a blessing, amen, that we even have couples to bring on staff, amen. Amari and Nicole have just jumped on and done incredible. Uh, the church has not skipped a beat. And, uh, and so we're really proud of, uh, of our couples and their willingness to be assistants. It's not easy being an assistant anywhere. It's especially not easy being an assistant under me. And so I have very, very high, yeah, we'll just leave it there. Numbers 13. So pray for me and pray for the Ryans now. <laughs> Amen. Numbers 13. I'm going to read 17 through 20. And then I am going to read 25 through 33. And then I'm going to read chapter 14, 6 through 10. It's a pretty lengthy. I'm, I'm going to read quite a bit. This is a sermon. I was just in 29 Palms. It's known uh, for its marine base. And so uh, the pastor there is... Uh, uh, um, Young pastor, amen, a great, great, great pastor. I mean, he's doing outstanding. That church has now put him full time. And uh, amen, uh, the church is, is just cranking it. it. It had an incredible feel, an incredible spirit. And uh, he asked if we could sermonize together. And so we were able to write this sermon uh, together. And so I was talking to Jeremiah Wacker, and uh, he was telling me a story about a small frog that lived deep underground in an old well. So what happens is this bird stops one day and he sees the frog down there in the bottom of the well. This is where he was born. This is where he lived. This is all he had ever seen. And so the bird begins to try to, uh, you know, talk him into coming out to the rest of the world. The bird began to describe just the, you know, beautiful things that he was looking at, uh, you know, the trees, the flowers, uh, all of these different animals, uh, and uh, he just, he could not, he could not talk the frog to coming out, and this is what the frog says, upon hearing this, uh, the frog laughed at the bird, thinking that the well was in fact the entire world, and so I thought about just two different perspectives there. One has a much broader perspective about life and the world, um, and the frog had a very narrow perspective about life and the world. Amen. We are going to read about Moses and the 12 spies. God sends 12 spies, or Moses sends 12 spies, um, and they come into the land of Canaan. They run into giants. They, we're going to hear about two men that had a different perspective out of the 12. Numbers 13 17 through 20, then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are 
or forest um, there uh, or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Uh, now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. Now jump down to verse 25 through 33. They went into the land. Now they come back to give a report and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and, and uh, all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. Um, they brought back word to them uh, and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Verse 28, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea. And along the banks of the Jordan, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. So he gives this report, and then the people start, uh, you know, no doubt, uh, just being afraid um, and complaining. Um, and uh, he said, uh, let us go up at once. Quiets the people. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Now listen to the other report from the other ten. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There, were, uh, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, uh, that came up from the giants. From the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and uh, also in their sight. Okay, now jump with me or uh, turn the page to Numbers 14, verses 6 through 10. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, these are the only two of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said, stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Two different perspectives. Let's look at a sermon I'm gonna, uh, that I've entitled, The Power of Perspective. Can I tell you that your view matters? Right? Verse 18, and see whether the land um, is good or bad, few or many. In other words, um, how you view life matters. This is what God was trying to get the spies to understand. You go in there and you decide what kind of land this is. You know, this is an amazing story. Because uh, how many know that these 12 people are looking at the exact same thing, but they both come out with two different perspectives. Joshua and Caleb say we can take the land, um, we can, uh, you know what, overcome them um, right now, as a matter of fact, let's go. But the other ten spies said, um, these are the descendants of Anak, uh, and we cannot take the land. Can I tell you tonight that your future hinges on how you view Canaan? Canaan is a picture of the world or of your circumstances right now. The things that are, that are holding you back from stepping into the promises uh, or the land that flows like milk and honey. Someone said, uh, in life your glass is either half empty or half full. Right? You're looking at the exact same glass that other people are looking at. But to some people it's half empty and to others it's half full. Someone said, if the only tool you have is a hammer then you tend to see every problem as a nail. How many know that's not good, right? I was reading about a, a shoe manufacturer who decided he wanted to open 
a business there in the Congo. And, uh, you know, it was still very remote. And so he sent uh, two salesmen in there, you know, just to spy out the land and see if they could sell some tennis shoes in there. And so immediately one called back and said, uh, prospect here, nil. No one wears shoes. The other salesman called uh, and said, this is a great place uh, to start a shoe business. Uh, nobody has any shoes here. Which, uh, which one of, the, of these salesmen are you when it comes to life? Because your walk with God is going to be filled with Canaan moments. And listen, God is always going to ask us to do things that are bigger than, than us. Things that seem impossible out of our reach. And how you view these challenges matters. Because if you're not careful, you can begin to resent these moments in your life. When God is asking you to do things that are difficult or outside of your comfort zone or your security zone. You can begin to resent this like, God, this isn't fair. God, why are you asking me to do this right now? Why do I have to go through this right now? Think about the, the three men with the talents. They were each given an opportunity to do something with a talent, but only two of them did. The other one viewed God as a hard master. Matthew 25, 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. I want you to notice the tone of this man. The man with the one talent. He said, I hid your talent. Can I tell you tonight that if you're struggling, amen, with the will of God, doing God's will, until you make it yours, it's not going to be pleasant. You can always view God as this hard person that's always asking you to do things that you don't want to do. It's always going to feel like a task. It's going to feel like a burden. You know, we were in a men's discipleship class in Prescott, Arizona. And uh, me and a, a good friend of mine were staying at a hotel. And I walked out. We're walking down the hallway. I walk out and I'm wearing a tie and some slacks. And he's dressed real comfortable. No tie, just a polo, you know, and some, some jeans. I think he had uh, some loafers on. And when he sees me, he says, really, dude, you're going to wear a tie? to a men's class. And so, you know, he's, he's a church kid. He was raised in church. And I said, what's wrong with it? He says, man, you know, you, you don't have to wear a tie. I said, bro, I don't do this because I have to. I do this because I like to. I like getting dressed up for God. But you know what? As I thought about it, he was born and raised in the church. His parents, his entire life forced him to wear a tie. I started wearing a tie when I was 27 years old. To me, it's not a task. It doesn't seem like a rule. To me, it's more like a privilege. Like I get to get dressed up for God. Never wore a tie in my life, beloved, until I got saved. And even then, it took a couple of years to get one on me. But you see, your perspective is different. Why would you wear a tie when you don't have to wear a tie? Right? Hey, pastor, beards are in now. How come you don't wear a beard? My pastor doesn't have a beard. I'm not going to have a beard. I want to be like my pastor. Who do you want to be like? I told you it was part two. I know other people are doing it. And I know it's not wrong or a sin. I don't do it. Right? And I'm talking more to preachers, more the guys that want to preach, just what I'm talking to you right now.
Think about David, Goliath, when it comes to perspective, perspective, and how you view God matters. The king and the children of Israel are afraid of Goliath. And David says, the same God that delivered me from the mouth of a lion and a bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. Here's the problem, though. The children of Israel were focused on the giant. David focused on God. Two different perspectives. Two different ways of looking at enemies or problems. So let's look at, secondly, what hinders a proper perspective. Numbers 13, 30 in our text, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are all well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Let's look at a, a few things that will hinder having a proper perspective. Number one is negative people. If you surround yourself, Brother Chapa mentioned this in the Sunday school, if you, if you surround yourself with negative people, right, if you surround yourself with people that don't want to do the will of God, are not willing to pay the extra price, are not willing to lay their lives down, then eventually those people are going to affect your life. And guess what? It's natural for people to lean towards being negative, it's easy to be negative. It's extremely challenging to be positive. Shad uh, Hems Hempstetter is an author. He said, as much as 77% of everything we think is negative uh, and counterproductive and works against us, people who grow up in an average household here know or are told uh, what they can't do more than 148,000 times by the time they reach 18. He says, hearing no or being part of a negative atmosphere can affect you up to 77%. Think about the officer who said, even if God opens up the windows of heaven, it wouldn't rain. Right? Elijah, he says, by tomorrow at this time, it's going to rain. And uh, the officer he says, hey, man, even if God opens the windows of heaven, this wouldn't happen. Second Kings 7, 1 through 2 says, uh, then Elijah said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, Seah, a fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and Seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, in fact, right, Elijah says, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And then if you just go down a few more verses in verse 18, so it happened, just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two sails of barley for a shekel and a sail of fine flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer had answered the man of God and said, now look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could such thing be? And he had said, uh, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. Remember what I said. How you view life determines your future. This officer died by his own words. And if all you do is speak negative, if all you do is hang around with negative people, then your perspective eventually is going to destroy you. You know what else hinders a, having a proper perspective is giants. You must have the right perspective when it comes to the giants in your life. When Goliath came against the Israelites, the soldiers all thought, man, he's so big, we'll never be able to kill him. Uh, and David thought, he's so big, how can I miss? 
same problem, same threat, two different perspectives. And if you're not careful, the way you view the giants in your life can hinder your future. Think about doubt. You can begin to question what God is doing in your life after you've been serving God for, uh, 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 you know, some time. You begin to question, God, am I even doing the right thing? Is it even worth me giving up my youth and sacrificing and being different? Fear can be a giant. The fear of the unknown. But you know what else we read in our text? Generational strongholds are giants. Look at verse 33. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came, that came from the giants. You know, if you're not careful, you can battle the same giants that your parents battled. You can fail in the same areas your parents failed. You can begin to want to quit in the same areas that your parents quit. These things are generational strongholds. You begin to think it's always been this way. This is all I know, and it's always going to be this way. It's going to stay this way. So in your eyes, like, like the spies, you become gra a, a grasshopper. Your problem becomes big. God shrinks. You buy into the lie that it's never going to change. You're never going to see breakthrough. You're never going to be different. You're never going to be able to be consistent. You know what else can hinder you is not being able to let go of your past. Look at verse 3 in chapter 14. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? You know, it's going to be extremely challenging, right, for you to move forward if you don't let go of your past. Little side note here for women that want to be pastor's wives. You're never going to do well unless you submit under what God has called your husband to be. Holding on to safety nets like old jobs. I'm just going to throw this out there. This is my opinion. Obviously, you run your home however you want. I don't personally like pastor's wives working. I've never really seen that be successful. I so appreciate women like Clarissa Alcala. She worked so hard to get her nursing license, and she gives it up. She gave it up before they went to Chetumal. When they came on as evangelists, I challenged her. I said, your kids need a mother at home. It's going to be very difficult to be involved in ministry if you're working and you're tired and you're keeping yourself up. And I know today's generation works from home. I get it. I get nervous with people that say they want to be pastor's wives, but they want to hold on to their job and their degrees. Again, this isn't a sin, and I understand that there's pastor's wives at work, I'm telling you how I feel about it. I understand that there's a time and a place. I remember when I fell in Victoria, I fell from a two-story roof, messed up my tailbone and my back. I couldn't work. I, I couldn't even stand. I couldn't get out of bed. My wife went to work. She supported our home until I was able to get back to work. I think it was about six months. She understood. Can my wife make money? <laughs> she, uh, ten times more than I could, that's for sure. But you know what she did? She gave up her past. Like I said this morning, she, she worked in those offices before. She was making plenty of money when I met her. She forfeited that. I'm going to let go of this so I can be a pastor's wife and I can focus on being a pastor's wife. Verse 4, 
verse 9 and chapter 14, only do not rebel against the Lord. Listen to what Joshua says. Nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection, protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. It's interesting to me as I'm reading this and studying this, the word that Joshua chose to use, um, do not rebel or do not be a rebel against what God is asking you to do. What an interesting, I mean, he could have said anything. Do not delay. Don't change your mind. No. Do not rebel. Number 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. You know what they said? Let's find a new leader. <laughs> you know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't like what Pastor Roman believes in. I don't like his opinions. This is how I believe, and this is how I want to do it, and I know other people in the fellowship that do it. So, I always, it, it always, uh, it, it, it puzzles me when I'm challenging someone and they say, well, um, I know so-and-so does it. But me and Nora don't. Pastor Ruby and Yolanda don't. Again, I have to ask you, who do you want to be like? You know, over 2 million people did not make it into the promised land because they had the wrong perspective in life. Only two out of the entire, that entire generation made it. Only Joshua and Caleb and God tells us why they made it and the others didn't. Look at verse 22 in chapter 14. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it, but my servant Caleb because he has a different spirit in him uh, and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land uh, where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. God says the, the reason that these two made it and the other two million didn't is because they had a different spirit. And like I said this morning, you have to decide who you want to be like. You have to decide whether you want to be different, whether you want a different spirit, or you just want to go along with what everybody else is doing. Like I said, people always come up to me, well, they allow this and they allow that. Yeah, but we don't, we don't, we don't do that. We, we don't suggest that. It's not enough to just dress like your pastor and sound like your pastor. You have to do what your pastor does if you want to be like your pastor. I remember talking to Pastor Moreno, man. I have him in the office. I'm like, Jeremy, what? I'm dealing with him because, you know, he's leaning towards being funny with everybody. And I said that you, there's no way in the world you can be a leader and a clown. That does not exist. And I remember I asked him, I said, Jeremy, who do you want to be like? What, who's your goal in life to be like? And he immediately responded, Pastor Ruby. I said, I, can, I, I believe you can be like Pastor Ruby, but you're going to have to do what Pastor Ruby does. His discipline, his integrity, his spirit, it's different. A lot of good pastors in our fellowship, amazing pastors. But there are some that have a different spirit. 
There's some that believe and have strong convictions in areas that other people don't. Again, doesn't, doesn't mean they're in the sin or wrong or anything, but you can, you can tell a tangible difference in those that are willing to do the little things that other people aren't. So let's close with rewards of keeping the proper perspective. In our text in chapter 13, 17 through 20, then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, uh, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, or whether the land is rich or poor, whether the forests are there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. The key to all of this is obedience. Obedience is the key to the promises of God. Right, let's close with three things God promises to those who have a different spirit or a different perspective. Number one is dominion. In Joshua 14, 11, Caleb said, as yet I am as strong this day on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Can I tell you that God created us to have dominion? Not just for a season, beloved, for our entire life. Caleb says, when I was 40, I was strong, I had dominion. Now that I'm 85, I have not changed. I'm still strong and I still have commitment. I still have dominion in my life. Caleb was 85 years old and he said, I am just as strong today. Are you just as strong today as you were the day you got saved? Or when you first got saved? Are you, are you still strong in your convictions? Are you still strong in prayer? Are you still strong in outreach? Are you just as strong today as you were back then? Because God called us to have dominion. Genesis 1:28, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. God says, I created you to have dominion. He says, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living cre uh, creature. Question, what area do you need to get dominion over? Are there areas in your life where you don't have dominion? Might be your speech. That's a, a, a nice way of saying it might be your mouth. Maybe you don't have dominion over your mouth. Maybe you say things that you shouldn't say quite often. Can I tell you that God created us to have dominion over our mouth? Over what we speak. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Do you need dominion over your finances? Is that an area where you, you do good sometimes and sometimes you don't? Pastor Wayman Mitchell used to talk about his, uh, the, one of the first churches that he pastored in Wickenburg. And uh, he said, you know, he was struggling, he couldn't pay his bills. Um, and that he's finally, he's looking at this and he said, you know what, this is not acceptable in my life. Not having God's blessing in the church finances is not acceptable. And he said that he rebuked the devil and that he said, you're going to get your, your foot off of the church finances. And the very next day. A lady shows up and says, uh, you know, I had sold a property and I had the money and uh, God spoke to me to bring it to you. And I believe that the lady brought about $1,300. This is uh, like back in the, in the 70s. It would be incredible amount today. But Pastor Mitchell said, you know what, this isn't acceptable. Me not having dominion in my finances is not acceptable. 
And here's the thing, though, is that you can only blame the devil for so long. I remember, man, these seasons, man, the Christmas and, you know, me and Nora always struggling because I was a contractor. Nine months out of the year, I made great money. But because I didn't have dominion over my money, we had nothing for three months. Is that, is that who you are? God puts incredible amounts of money, and then you go from having this money, you spend it, and then you're back to, oh, my gosh, I don't know what we're going to do. It's like, what? What in the world? What would you do with all the money? It's time to rebuke the devil, and it's time to rebuke yourself. I told you what Josh Mendes said, man. I was so blown away with him. 25 years old, car paid off, owns his own house. And he said, I was blown away what I saw the guys here in McAllen doing. Every day, Starbucks, every day eating out. He said, I'd rather buy a house than eat and go to Starbucks. Destiny, pick the good guy. Smart, you're not going to have a lot of problems, I'll tell you that. Do you have dominion? You have dominion when it comes to consistency. Because these are areas, beloved, where people, they'll reach a certain level, a certain amount of commitment, and then they, they fizzle out. It's expected already. What about fruitfulness? Verse 20, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. This past week, this past Tuesday, November 15th, the world reached 8 billion people at 2 p.m. The most people that have ever lived on planet Earth at one time. Are you fruitful? Do you have dominion in this area? Pastor Greg Mitchell says, being unfruitful is not acceptable. Verse 27, then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. See, everything good in life, beloved, is going to cost you. Fruitfulness involves a fight. They had to go take that cluster away from giants. It's not automatic because we're Christians, right? When, when you're unfruitful, it has to bother us. Rachel said, give me children lest I die, right? In Genesis 30 verse 1, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children else I die. You know, she envied her sister. She didn't wish evil against her sister, but she envied her in the sense because she was fruitful and she wasn't. This bugged her. Rachel is basically saying, if I can't be fruitful, then why live? My wife says, I always look angry when I'm preaching. I'm not, I'm not mad. I, don't, I hope you don't think I'm, I'm excited. I, you know, I believe doing what I do with passion. Let's all be fruitful. It's just not going to work for me. It's like, be fruitful, man. Let's take it. Come on, we can do it. It's, come on, y'all. It's like, it's just, I can't even act gay. And so, <laughs> it's not in me, sorry. You know, God's timing is everything. Look at verse 20. 
and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. You know, I believe this is where our church is right now. God is, is challenging us to grow. God's challenging us to take dominion. I feel as if he's saying, if you just get serious about this, I'll anoint you. Quit mocking people and making fun of people all the time. And maybe God will elevate you. Get dominion over that area. So people can take you serious. See, God's timing is everything. Sometimes we are in too much of a rush and we tend to focus on the negative things or the things that we don't have. You have to learn to be content where God has you right now and make the most of it. Philippians 4.11, Paul said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Are you happy? See, in order to be happy and doing God's will, you know what you have to do? You ready for this? You have to be willing to surrender. To God's plan, not, not, not yours. I, God, I don't want to do this. God says surrender. You have to surrender his plan. Because your perspective matters. The children of Israel were miserable people. Why? Because they were constantly looking back. Constantly wanting to do what the world was doing. And then you have Joshua and Caleb. A different spirit. They love serving God. They love being in church. They love doing God's will. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, as I close, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, listen, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. Paul says, there's liberty when you surrender. There's no more fight. There's no more wishing you were somewhere else. There's no more, why do we have to do this? There's, it's just, God, I surrender. This, I'm saved. Whatever you want of me, that's what I'm going to do. And Paul says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What, listen, it doesn't feel like you're caged up in rules. You feel free. Like rules, standards are a blessing to your life. You, you recognize them. Wow, without these guidelines, man, I'd be a mess. God, I surrender to whatever you're asking me to do, whatever I need to add in my life. Add it. I want to be free. But when you always... Perspective matters. Why are people miserable? I believe because they refuse to surrender. And until you say, God, these are some areas I need dominion in. But you know what? I surrender to your will. And if you help me, I'll get dominion. You know, if I were to show you the list of men throughout just the last two years that come up to me and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm getting serious. You can count on me. <laughs> and, they don't, and they don't come to prayer. They don't come to Sunday school. They don't come to. It's like, okay, what kind of serious are you talking about? Are you talking about like my kind of serious or whose kind of serious? It's, it, it, it can't depend on. Your emotions being stirred. It has to be a decision for life. God, I, I want a different spirit. And I want to have the right perspective. Because perspective matters. Let's bow our heads.
There's power in having the right perspective. You know that having the right perspective is what keeps you aligned with God? You know who the happiest teenagers are that live at home? The ones that have surrendered to their parents. You know who the happiest adults are in church? The ones that have surrendered to God's plan. The ones that are content. God, I'm, I'm happy. I'm going to learn the most. I want, I'm going to be the best at everything that I do. I'm going to do it with passion. I'm going to, 100% I'm going to give. But if we approach everything in church as a task, a rule, I love what one disciple said to me. He says, I don't have to, I get to. And I get it, you know, I'm I'm talking about my friend and to him wearing a tie, I guess is a drag. To me, man, I, I love it. Can't wait to get dressed up to come to God's house. If you're not careful, you're that person, man, right? You're in the hallway, you're already taking off your tie. Because to you, it's a task. And someone forced you to do that when you were younger. I want to challenge the church tonight. Let's surrender. Let's just surrender to God's will. God, I want to, I want to be free. I want to be happy. I don't want to be in church, miserable, feeling like I have to come because my wife is making me or my, my husband is making me. No, I, I want to be here. Before I go any further, you'd say, Pastor, I am not saved. My heart is not right. I've rebelled against God. Tonight, I want to surrender to his will and his purposes in my life. It begins with accepting Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior. If that's you tonight, you want me to pray for you, you want to receive Jesus in your heart, you're ready to turn your ways or turn your back on the ways ways of this world. You want me to pray for you to receive Jesus Christ. I want you to lift your hand right there where you're at and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm going to surrender. I'm, I'm, I'm handing my life over to Jesus. He can do whatever he wants with me. You're backslidden, backslider. I want you to lift your hand tonight. Hallelujah. I want to speak to the church. Let's come to this altar not because it's just another service and this is what we have to do. Let's come with a heart. Let's approach it with a heart of surrender. There's some people here, man, you've been fighting, man, in your spirit, man. You're just, and you're, you're, you're not happy. And Paul says there's no way. There's no liberty. There's no freedom. There's others here, you, when it comes to finances, you have no dominion. God can even put incredible amounts into your hand. Somehow, it gets spent, you find yourself upside down, and in the same mess you were before. The day came when I had to decide to get dominion over my finances. Hallelujah. Church, let's stand to our feet. These, al- these altars are open. There's some people here, you're struggling. You're, you're fighting every step of the ways. Why do we have to? Why do we need to? Why is this? Why is that? In other churches, they don't. And why does Pastor Omi have to believe like that? And why does he have to be so strict? And why does he have to be so different? I, I do it. Because that's what I was discipled under. I do it because I admire men with a different spirit. They're my heroes. They're who I want to be. They they are who I want to be like.
Father, I'm asking you tonight, my God, to help us, God, to be a church with a different spirit, God. Thank you for our fellowship and everything that you're doing and everything you're allowing us to be a part of. Thank you that our fellowship already has a different spirit. And I pray tonight that you would just add to that, that there would be men and women here that would desire to consecrate their lives to be different. Men and women that would surrender to your purposes and your will in their lives, God. God, we surrender tonight. Casting aside every sin and every God, we don't want to come to church because we have to. Fix my eyes on you. God, give us a new heart. I lay my burdens down. The right spirit. Letting the cares of this world Eager fade away. to be in your presence, God. Anxious one to hear your word. I ask, is one thing that I seek, that I may dwell in your house, O oh Lord, my King. God, we want to have dominion in our finances. All the days of my life, I want to gaze upon you. Help us to have dominion over our tongue, God. To speak life and not death. To be positive. Help us to change our ways, Lord, in those areas that have been handed down from generation. Break that curse. Fix my eyes on you. I lay my burdens down. Letting the cares of this world not be One thing I ask is one thing Help us to be fruitful, God. Not being fruitful, God, is not acceptable. I may dwell in your house, O Lord, Days of my life, I want to gaze upon your beauty. Oh, Shiore Lobo Bobo Bobo Sanda, E Kaleba Sanda, yes, God. Because one thing Lord, I ask, we surrender, God. We surrender, God. We surrender, Lord. That I may be a Lobo Sanda, your Lord, my King. All the days of my life, I want to gaze oh. upon your beauty and seek you in this home. Oh, yes, place. amen. Lift your hands, church. Help me sing tonight. So one thing I ask is one thing that I see that I may dwell in your house, oh, oh Lord, my King. And all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in this holy place. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, I give you all the praise. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. Amen. Glory to God. Um, remember tomorrow, the, the ladies, amen, you're going to come decorate the tree, bring those uh, different color ornaments. Um, uh, please, husbands, uh, help with the children. And 11 and older, I believe it's 11 and older, can come here and join uh, their mother, their grandma, whoever's bringing them. Uh, remember, no street preaching tomorrow. And Wednesday, I know it's Thanksgiving on Thursday, but I'm doing part three. <laughs> so it's it's gonna be good amen but it is it is part three and so um we're gonna have a great time amen let's believe god and uh and we're gonna trust amen just that god uh you know it's just you know we, we need to contend just to have a different spirit amen hallelujah heads are bowed eyes are closed we are going to dismiss and uh, believe god amen you know what uh, samuel uh, can you dismiss us?
Mr. Miss? No? Okay, let me, uh, Daniel. Amen. God bless you, church. 718. Amen. Hallelujah.